There are two kinds of underwater videographers in the world. Those that know how to manually dial in their exposure and those who don't. Yes. Hey guys, I'm Anya from Aquatic Images. Today we're gonna to take a closer look at using manual exposure while shooting underwater video and why it gives you a better image. So the beauty of learning how to manually expose your videos is that it also teaches you all you need to know about a whole bunch of other features. In addition to learning about shutter speed, aperture and ISO, you'll also learn about exposure compensation, depth of field, lens sharpness, sensor noise, dynamic range and frame rates. My first professional underwater camera was the Canon 7D and I got it way back in 2010. And I took that thing around the world, shooting photos and videos in the ocean and on land. And honestly guys, I didn't know much about manual camera features back then. And it took me some time before I started to pick it up. But once I did, I suddenly had a much deeper understanding of why some images came out better or worse than others. Instead of letting the camera do all the creative decisions, I took control and I feel like my work got a lot better from doing so. So if you pay good attention over the next few minutes, I'm going to compress everything it took me a long time to learn into a short, easy to understand video. Now, first things first, not all cameras has this feature where you can manually expose your videos. It's normally not found in action cameras or lower end compacts. But even if your current camera setup lacks this feature, there will be a lot of useful information in this video for you regardless. And who knows, it might help you pick out a camera with manual features the next time you upgrade. A lot of the information given here on exposure for video also translates somewhat to photography. So what is manual exposure? Simply put, it's controlling your camera's aperture, ISO and shutter speed to obtain a correctly exposed image. It takes care of certain problems that are associated with automatic exposure, such as incorrect shutter lag, incorrect depth of field, ISO noise or flickering which is quite common in underwater videos. The reason you get flickering is that the subjects we tend to shoot can be reflective or they tend to swim up and down in the water column where light intensity is different. Manually controlling your exposure essentially gives you full creative control over your image. As long as you understand the variables this is hugely useful to anyone who wants to get the most out of their camera. Exposure is often explained by associating the three variables to a triangle, where you've got ISO, shutter speed, and aperture. Let's get started with the basics of each of them. ISO is your camera's sensitivity to light. You would normally increase your ISO if you're shooting in low light situations. So let's say you're shooting at ISO 100 during a bright sunny day, but perhaps you're using ISO 400 if it's cloudy or if the visibility is quite poor. But there's a trade-off, with higher ISOs comes more noise, which basically translates into a lower image quality. However, modern day sensors are quite good in higher ISO ranges, so it's less noticeable on many new cameras than on older ones. Next up on the triangle, we got shutter speed. And this is where you get the biggest differences between photography and videography exposure. With video exposure, shutter speed is actually very simple and it relates to frame rates, which we're going to get more into later. But let's say you're based in the US shooting at the standard frame rate at a normal speed, which is 30 frames per second. The simple rule of shutter speed for video is double your frame rate. What's 30 times 2? 60, that's right. So on your camera, your shutter speed should be set to 1 60th of a second. And that's it, you leave it there. Unless you're shooting slow motion, which we'll get more into later. But why do we have this rule, you might ask? Well, some wise guys back in the ages figured out that the world that we observe isn't always crisp and sharp, especially when we observe motion. Hence, they calculated this simple rule to make video look more realistic to us as viewers. The last entry on the exposure triangle is aperture. Aperture relates to the physical opening inside of your lens, which is what determines how much light your sensor will be exposed to. If the opening is large, more light will come through. If the opening is small, less light will come through. 
We measure aperture in fractions or f-stops, which is probably where it gets most confusing. A larger opening is measured with a smaller number than a small opening. So if we're talking about an aperture of f2.8, that's quite a large opening. But if we're talking about an aperture of f22, that's a small opening. So that's the basics of exposure. You have these three variables that you adjust to obtain the image that you want. Now they all relate to each other, which is where EVs and stops come in. As we've already touched on, ISO, aperture and shutter speed are all measured in numbers. So let's take a closer look at what those numbers are and how they're connected. With ISO, this is quite easy. Each time you double your ISO, you're increasing your exposure by one full stop. So for example, ISO 100 might be your camera's base ISO. If you multiply that by two, you're now at ISO 200 and you've gained one full stop of light. Next is ISO 400, 800, 1600, you get the idea. If you go the other way and divide your ISO by two, you go down one full stop or you lose one full stop of light. This is also how it works with shutter speed. So if we're talking about doubling the shutter speed of 1 60th, we're now at about 1 1 20th of a second, although most cameras will show that as 1 1 25th. Next you get 1 2 50th, 1 500th, etc, etc. These are examples of going down one full stop. If you go the other way from 1 60th, you get to 1 30th, 1 15th, etc. This would be examples of gaining one full stop. You with me so far? I hope so, because next is aperture and it's a little bit more complicated. With aperture, we don't have a simple line of numbers we can multiply or divide. Without getting overly technical, aperture is arranged in a geometric series, hence the sequence is made up of a different line of numbers. So you got f1.4, f2, f2.8, f4, f5.6 and so on. By going from say f2.8 to f4, you're going down one full stop of light because you're making the lens opening smaller. With these numbers, there's no mathematical formula to follow. You simply have to memorize the scale, which actually isn't that difficult. So to sum it up so far, by increasing or decreasing a value at any of the variables, you'll also need to balance that out by increasing or decreasing a value at a different variable. This is assuming you have a correct exposure. And having a correctly exposed image usually means that neither the scene or the subject is over or underexposed, which means nothing is overly bright or overly dark. Now there's also other factors at play when it comes to adjusting any of these variables we've talked about. One of the ones with ISO is that when you have higher ISOs, you get more sensor noise. Now, another one of the trade-offs associated with higher ISOs is dynamic range. Dynamic range is a term used to describe the level of detail you get in the shadows and the highlights of an image. If you use very high ISOs, it will decrease your dynamic range, meaning you'll have less details in the shadows and in the highlights. Most cameras have their highest dynamic range at their ISO base value, which is normally one of the lowest ISOs you can use. I mentioned earlier that shutter speed ties up to frame rates and the only way to truly have a good understanding of what shutter speed for video is, is to fully understand frame rates. So first, let's assume you're a citizen of US, Canada or Japan. That means you're probably shooting on the NTSC standard. NTSC shooters shoot in 30 frames per second or 29.97 frames, don't ask. If you're from Europe, Australia, New Zealand or India, you're shooting at the PAL system, which is 25 frames per second. On top of that, you got the standard frame rate for cinema, which is 24 frames per second or 23.976 frames. Don't ask. So you're either shooting at 24, 25 or 30 frames per second. So what you need to do is double your frame rate. As we already went over, 30 times 2 equals 60, making your shutter speed 1 60th of a second. 25 times 2 is 50, making your shutter speed 1 50th of a second. 24 times 2 is 48, however most cameras don't have 1 48th of a second, so you round it up to 1 50th of a second. But what happens when we shoot slow motion? If shooting a 10 second clip at 30 frames per second gives us 10 seconds of video, what happens when we shoot it at 60 frames per second? 
Well, then we're capturing twice as many frames as we need. So if we take those 60 frames and convert it into 30 frames, we end up with a clip that is double as long and displays at 50% slow motion. So depending on the frame rates that your camera can shoot, you can capture variable slow motion effects. Now, what was the rule for shutter speed again? Double your frame rate. So if you're shooting something at 60 frames per second, you need to double your frame rate to 1 20th per second, which your camera doesn't display, so you make it 1 1 25th. So the conclusion is that shooting slow motion footage requires a faster shutter speed, meaning it requires you to compensate by adjusting your ISO or your aperture. Next up, we got depth of field, which relates to your f-stops. Depth of field is measured by how much of the image is in focus. With larger aperture stops like say f2, you get a very shallow depth of field, meaning your subject might be in focus, but the background will be quite blurred out. With smaller aperture stops, more of the image stays in focus. On top of that, sensor size also plays a part here, with smaller sensors having less depth of field. So if you're having problems getting that blurry background on your small sensor camera, it's not you. And also just to throw it out there, it's easier to get subject separation on a longer focal range, like say 50 millimeter instead of 20 millimeter. So with all that in mind, if having a shallow depth of field is your goal, you need a camera with a large sensor, a lens with a wide aperture and a longer focal range and a lot of money. Oh, and one more thing, most lenses are actually sharpest between aperture f5.6 and f8. It can be tough keeping track of all the different full stops, and just to confuse you, I actually forgot to mention there's also half stops and one third stops. So if there's a bunch of numbers in between the numbers we already talked about, that's what those are. But they also relate to each other, meaning there's a full stop in between each half stop, and there's a full stop in between each third stop. Simple, right? Yeah, you guys get it. All right, so I should probably give you a few examples of what I've been talking about here. So this shot is captured at 4K at 50 frames in quite good lighting using an aperture of f5.6. As you can see, the subject is in quite good focus and although there's not a lot of motion going on, the image is captured at double the frame rate, meaning 1 100th of a second. Base ISO on my camera is 200, this was shot at 400. Next we got this close-up shot captured at 50mm focal range using an f1.8 aperture. As you can see, the divers in the background are quite blurred out and the anemone in front has a very shallow depth of field, like some of it's even out of focus. There you have it folks, how to use manual exposure for underwater shooting. I teach underwater videography courses and this is one point where a lot of beginners especially struggle, but it's also what they're most appreciative of once they've learned how to use it. So I do highly recommend that you try to learn and apply this to your underwater videos. I know a lot of people who find this scary and don't quite understand how I incorporate this into shooting underwater where you also have a lot of other things to think about. So please don't let this distract you as nothing is more important than your safety and the well-being of the ecosystems that you visit. Start by practicing on land and slowly incorporate it on the water. As always, if you have any questions about anything, feel free to drop them in the comments below and please consider subscribing to us for more underwater content. And if you want to learn more about underwater videography, go check out this video next on how to get perfect colors using only ambient light. That's it for me folks, have a good one.